Good afternoon. I'm Ira Selkowitz, the director of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program, known shorthandedly as the Collegiate Program, at the University of Colorado Denver Business School. And along with Melanie Kay, the director of the Collegiate Program at the University of Colorado School of Law, Kent Noble, the director of the Collegiate Program at the University of Wyoming College of Business, and Stephanie Johnson, the director of the Collegiate Program at the University of Colorado Boulder Leeds School of Business. We are pleased to welcome you to a look inside the Varsity Blues College Admissions Cheating Scandal. Our program is co-sponsored by the Colorado Chapter of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which is providing two hours of CPE continuing education ethics credit for this program. The namesake of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program is Bill Daniels, who was a pioneer in the cable television industry, as well as an owner of sports teams. Bill's success in business was due in no small part to his ethical business practices based on eight principles. These principles are integrity, trust, accountability, transparency, fairness, respect, <clears throat> adherence to the rule of law, and creating long-term value for all relevant stakeholders. When Bill passed away, his estate went to the Daniels Fund, a private charitable foundation that he had established. One of the programs of the foundation is the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program, which provides grants to instill principle-based ethics education at the collegiate level in the four state region of Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. The collegiate program is comprised of 11 business schools in this four state region, plus the University of Colorado School of Law, which is known as Colorado Law. A major goal of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program is outreach to the business community. This program is an example of just such outreach and we have a lot of members of the business community here. I have just a few administrative matters before we begin. Our program is divided into two sections. We will begin with a conversation between Melanie Kay of Colorado Law and Eric Rosen, the lead prosecutor in the Operation Varsity Blues case. After a Q&A session with Mr. Rosen, Kent Noble of the University of Wyoming will moderate a panel discussion with Shelley Dodd, Jill Keegan, and Linda Miller, experts respectively in the fields of college admissions, college athletics, and fraud detection. Another Q&A session will follow the panel discussion. Please note that we are recording this program and the recording will be uploaded to YouTube within the next few weeks. All registrants will receive a link to the recording. For any tech related questions, please use the chat button on your screen. That would be the chat button for anything related to tech. For the Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your screen to ask questions of the speakers and panelists. I will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the program and we will get to as many questions as we can in the last 15 minutes of each of the program segments. And now I would like to introduce Professor Melanie Kay of Colorado Law, who will lead the discussion with Eric Rosen. Ms. Kay is a faculty instructor who joined the University of Colorado Law School in 2015 as the director of Colorado Law's Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program. The Collegiate Program at Colorado Law focuses on helping law students develop strong, principled, ethical, and professional identities through courses, experiential programming, and other hands-on opportunities. She is also a co-director of Colorado Law's Master of Studies of Law, MSL, and in the, in the Ethics and Compliance degree program. Professor Kay teaches a variety of legal ethics and ethical culture courses to both JD and MSL students at the law school. Professor Kay came to Colorado Law after 10 years of litigation experience. She primarily practiced environmental law with the nonprofit public interest law firm Earth Justice in Denver, Colorado. She has also practiced general civil litigation at Latham and Watkins in San Francisco and Wheeler Trig O'Donnell in Denver. Immediately after law school, she clerked on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for the Honorable Proctor Hug Jr. in Reno, Nevada. Professor Kay earned her JD from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, her MS in Environmental Geochemistry from the University of Montana, and her AB in Earth Sciences from Dartmouth College. Thank you and enjoy the program. 
Thank you so much, Ira, for that great introduction. Um, and thanks to everyone for being here and welcome on behalf of Colorado Law. Um, we're really thrilled to have you join us today for what should be a really interesting and exciting program. Um, just a quick note, if you'd like to chat on anything um, or make a comment or introduce yourself in the chat, please feel free. Um, it definitely leads to a bit more of a community feel. Um, but questions that you would like to submit for Q&A after our conversation, please put those in the Q&A instead of the chat. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, our first speaker of the uh, program, Eric Rosen. Um, I'm thrilled to have him join us today. Um, he's been incredibly generous with his time and enthusiastic about this program, so I'm really pleased to have him here with us. I will do a brief introduction of Eric, um, and then we'll dive in to learning a bit more about the Varsity Blues scandal. So Eric Rosen is a partner at Roche Friedman LLP in their New York office. He is a nationally recognized former federal prosecutor whose practice focuses on white collar criminal defense, corporate investigations, and complex civil litigation. Eric was the lead prosecutor in Operation Varsity Blues, the seminal case widely known as the college admissions scandal, one of the largest white collar crime prosecutions in US history. From May 2012 through October 2020, Eric was an assistant US attorney in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Boston, Massachusetts. While serving as a federal prosecutor, Eric prosecuted more than 250 defendants for a wide variety of federal crimes, including wire and mail fraud, securities fraud, investor fraud, bribery, healthcare fraud, drug misbranding, money laundering, laundering, drug trafficking, racketeering, smuggling, and firearms offenses. Eric also tried as lead and co-counsel numerous criminal cases before federal juries, both in Pittsburgh and in Boston. In March 2018, Eric began the Operation Varsity Blues investigation that led a year later to charges against approximately 50 individuals for fraud, bribery, and money laundering offenses related to the college admissions process. Eric's work in the landmark prosecution, which generated significant worldwide media attention, has been widely profiled by national and international publications, including the Boston Globe, the New York Times, CNN, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and USA Today. In addition, Eric's role as the lead prosecutor was chronicled in the July 2020 book, Unacceptable, written by two Wall Street Journal reporters. Eric has a JD from Columbia Law School, an LLM degree from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, and a BA from Harvard in Government. Eric, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you and thank you for the, uh, for the kind introduction. It's, it's great to be here, at least uh, virtually in Colorado today. Um, for those of you less familiar with the Varsity Blues scandal, I want to provide a brief kind of high level background of what happened. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't read the book Unacceptable, I'd recommend that for a deeper dive. Um, and I gather the Netflix documentary is coming out really soon, which will give you another look um, into this really um, interesting scheme. So in March 2012, the public first learned of a massive illegal college admission scheme whereby wealthy families had gotten their children into elite colleges and universities through illicit methods. The scam centered around a man named Rick Singer, who was a high profile college admissions counselor who touted his ability to give kids an edge in getting into schools. While some of his counseling and other services were in fact legitimate, his big money maker was getting kids admitted by cheating. So he had a few different methods for doing this. On the testing side, he had an ACE test taker, a Harvard grad, who would pose as the teenager Singer worked with to get them high SAT or ACT scores, he also had corrupt proctors in special testing locations that would give kids more time or even change their answers after they finished. He had a network of coaches he paid to get kids admitted as athletic recruits, even if they didn't even play the sport. In fact, some families even photoshopped their children playing sports they'd never even tried or bought gear online to stage photos. Singer funneled the payments from these parents into his own charity organization, from which he made donations, um, in quotes, <laughs> to schools' athletic programs. Prosecutors kept their investigation under wraps until March 2019, when details of the scandal exploded in the media after a day of high-profile arrests. At that point, it was revealed that Singer's clients included business moguls, lawyers, and high-profile celebrities uh, and other high-society families. The schools involved included such high-profile institutions as Yale, Stanford, Georgetown, USC, UCLA, 
University of Texas and others. Um, so Eric, you were the first person to uncover the earliest bits of evidence that led to the discovery of this absolutely massive college admissions scandal. And many will be surprised to learn that you uncovered it initially quite by accident. Um, can you describe that story and how quickly did you realize that you were onto something pretty huge? Sure, and let me just a disclaimer first. You know, I'm no longer with the Department of Justice, but uh, you know, the opinions that I'm, I'm sharing are, are certainly my, my own and don't reflect the, uh, you know, Department of Justice opinions. No, don't aren't meant to reflect at all on the on the guilt or innocence of any of any of the people uh, involved. And you know, I'm I'm happy to share uh, you know the the public information that's been that's been provided. Um, that's been out there. I, you know, I think one of the, one of the most interesting things and, you know, it, it's chronicled sort of in the book was just about how, you know, in a lot, like, like in a lot of investigations, um, luck played a huge, a huge part of it. And, you know, when we began, uh, Varsity Blues in March of 2018, the, um, we had no idea what, you know, that this was even going on, that this was, uh, you know, a, a crime that was being committed by people and that it, it was occurring on such a uh, large scale. Well, essentially what happened, what happened was we were investigating a, um, a large securities fraud ring um, and you know, which was sort of a crime that it's frequently prosecuted typically in conjunction with the Securities and Exchange Committee. And uh, one, of the, one of the people that we were uh, going after or was the target of the investigation uh, and you know, as publicly known, tried to was interested in cooperating with um, with investigators after uh, a search warrant was executed at his home in in uh, February of 2018. Um, in March, he uh, flew to uh, to Boston to meet with us. And as as is typical, sometimes the debriefs can take a take a period of time. Um, and then on the second day of the of the debrief, uh, he informed us that he had been bribing uh, the Yale soccer coach. And basically everything sort of uh, uh, took off from there. And it was a very rapid uh, beginning to the investigation, starting with, um, you know, as sort of detailed, uh, you know, previously recorded telephone calls between the cooperator and, and the Yale soccer coach. From there, you know, recorded telephone calls between the Yale soccer coach and um, you know, Mr. Singer. And then from there, uh, as is known, sort of a, a, a wiretap that launched the uh, investigation. So it was a very rapid sort of uh, twist from securities fraud investigation to college admissions. But um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of hard work put in by everyone involved at that time. So what were your initial reactions during this investigation as you start like pulling a couple of these strings and unraveling things? I mean, were you in total shock and what surprised you the most as you were starting to uncover things? And did you ever have a sense it would be um, extend as broadly as it did? Um, no, I, I didn't. And I, I think, you know, you know, I always sort of begin with the fact that people really only touch on the college admissions pro you know, process sort of once in their life um, when they're going through it, if they're going to college or maybe again, when their kids are going through it, um, you know, I graduated from college uh, in 2000, over 20 years ago. So I hadn't really thought about it a lot since then. Um, and uh, so my first sort of reaction, I remember, was like, "Oh, I didn't realize that would be a, a thing." Uh, with you know, in terms of you know, or or I'm not you know a recruited athlete, or I wasn't at that time, so I didn't know that 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 would be a, a means of sort of getting in. I had sort of you know like everybody, like most people had sort of just applied and, you know, wherever I got in, I got in and, you know, I ended up going to, going to a school. And that was sort of my, my, the, my, my sort of basis for the college admissions process. I hadn't really since then given it really a lot of thought um, other than, you know, potentially during sort of law school applications. So my initial sort of like, sort of reaction, I remember was simply sort of like a, wow, that's sort of weird. Um, it's sort of a weird type of, uh, type of, um, scam, uh, going on. Um, but then I realized, you know, we sort of quickly realized that it was at, and, you know, at this point also in the beginning, we only had one person, uh, under, you know, uh, you know, I thought it would be sort of a one-off case, maybe with the Yale soccer coach and obviously it escalated from there, uh, significantly. Um, so, the, so, so the answer is no, I didn't, we, I don't think anybody thought it would be. Um, 
quite as big uh, as it as it as it got, and how it got you know so quickly, so big was you know something I'm I'm still a little bit in uh, in disbelief for. Yeah, I had the exact same reaction. I mean, same as you. I was a 2000 college graduate, so same amount of times. <laughs> right. Myself. And I was like, people do this? <laughs> like, right. looking back, you know, to, it made me feel a little bit naive of like, oh, I thought you studied hard and took the tests and, you know, wrote a really good essay and you just hope for the best. Right. Um, and so it was fascinating to see that other people had a very different mentality about, um, you know, entitlement, honestly, in terms of this process. Um, are you able to share a little bit about this sort of early investigation and timeline strategy um, and how assistance from this person that you were investigating and yeah. the Yale soccer coach actually led you um, to Rick Singer and how you sort of decided to proceed once you learned about Singer and his network? Sure, I mean, I'll share, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of share what, what, what I can. I mean, the, um, you know, the, what, what's public, public out there, obviously appropriate, but the, the um, you know, one of the things I love the most about being in AUSA is is the investigation and how things unfold. And every everyone is unique, everyone is different, um, and everyone presents challenges. Uh, a lot of one of the things I really enjoy the most about being, you know, a lawyer, particularly with the Department of Justice, is sort of to mentally sort of game out strategy and figure out what are the best sort of tactics. Um, and obviously, we had you know a wide variety. Uh, a variety of tactics sort of available to us. I had been uh, a drug, drug and sort of gun prosecutor for five and a half years before switching over to um, white collar crime. And I had really thought I had in, in that capacity, I had done a lot of wiretaps. Um, and I really thought that a, the evidence you get from a wiretap, the, the calls, um, are, you know, that's some of the strongest evidence you can, you can, you can get as a prosecutor, as a, as a lawyer in, in general. And um, so that was sort of the decision, you know, it collectively made was to go from, which is typical, um, is to go from sort of, you know, controlled recordings, meaning a, someone consenting up to a, you know, up to a wiretap where you're, where you're, uh, you know, getting information. And, and so the definition of a wiretap, obviously, is that neither party is consenting to the to the phone call, so no one knows you're listening, and and um, it became obviously very very incriminating. Um, and of course, coupled with that, we got um, you know a lot of email emails uh, through search warrants and various other means that really led uh, led us and the rest of the investigative team to to put together the information um, clearly and sh and uh, you know present a compelling case. But um, in terms of the rapidness with how everything you know, came together, it was a really interesting, uh, really, you know, an interesting process and um, one that uh, obviously involved a tremendous amount of, of work and, uh, and uh, precision. So how hard was it to keep this completely secret? Because, I mean, were you worried about, you know, Singer's network getting tipped off at any point? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a great question. And it's something like speaking from a very, from a broad point of view, it's something that it impacts every investigation you do um, as to what is to keep it, keep it secret. Um, in a, in a, you know, in a drug investigation, you, you have to, um, typically you keep it secret to the very end. Sometime in a white collar case, you, you know, you keep the initial investigation secret, but sometimes you need records. Uh, and then people typically find out if you're asking, you know, associates or businesses uh, for records. So there's always a, a dividing line that you have to take in terms of um, investigative strategy and whether you think that will alert subjects of the investigation. Obviously, you know, in, in, in this case, um, uh, keeping things secret was, was, was critical. Um, and I think, you know, as, as sort of we, you know, publicly said, um, Singer did plead guilty to an obstruction uh, charge. And so obviously, you know, you know, and as part of that obstruction charge, he had tipped off uh, members of the, you know, members of his circle. So um, what, what I guess what I'm getting at is it how much information you can reveal is, you know, a critical part of investigation, it certainly was in Varsity Blues. Um, the farther we progressed, the more we got to what we were thinking of, um, you know, like a takedown or something like that, uh, which was in March of 19, you know, the more you can sort of, um, you know, the more you can sort of 
you know, you know, tip your hand a little bit more, but in terms of like the initial stages, it was extremely important to keep things sort of under wraps. So at around 6 a.m. Um, on March 12th, 2019, almost exactly two years ago uh, to the day, FBI agents fanned out across the country, pounding on the doors of some of the wealthiest and most powerful families in the country. There were 13 homes in Los Angeles alone. Um, some of the LA parents all ended up in jail cells together, which is where the prisoners slowly started to figure out that they all had Rick Singer in common. How did you react to the intense attention when these arrests occurred um, and when the charges and the investigation were suddenly made public? Were you surprised by the intensity of the public response or were you expecting it? Um, had you ever dealt with media attention like this before and, and what was that like? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was very surprised. Um, I was very, I was, I was very surprised. I had a, uh, a, a funny conversation with a colleague, you know, a couple of days before the, as to how much, uh, how much, whether we thought anybody would really care about something like this, um, given obviously the world's problems and complexities and, uh, and he, and he was betting on a very, you know, a morning news story, and then it would you know, quickly pass over. And um, I didn't really have a bet, but I was, I thought it would be maybe a multi-day story, um, given given the nature of the people. But um, obviously, it, it blew up from that. And you know, the thing that surprised me, you know, Varsity Blues is one thing. It's it was, you know, obviously a, a case, um, but it sort of got its own legs and I think touched off a, a wider a wider discussion, which I find probably the most interesting part of the case in terms of, you know, wealth inequality um, and, and things like that. A college admissions process, typically uh, transparency in the college admissions process and just sort of the general, what is merit and what, what is that, what do we aspire to be as sort of a uh, society in terms of, um, in, term, in terms of the emissions criteria. And, and that to me was very surprising. I, I, when, you're, when you're a prosecutor, you're, the only thing you're focused on is the evidence uh, involved and, and not the, the wider implications. But I was, uh, I was, very, I was very surprised. Um, and I think you know, the first sentencing I did uh, in June of 2019, I really tried to you know, comb through the news, comb through comments on the New York Times website from students and things like that to really, really try to pick up on that and explain just the significance of the, of the uh, case and sort of what it meant to those either entering college or, or how elite college admissions sort of affected them. Yeah, it, those are, you know, kind of great larger, I think societal implications and we're gonna turn to some more of those in a moment. Um, so, it, in, in describing his services to parents, Rick Singer would um, tout this uh, side door concept he had. And so to explain that for a moment, um, his side door, which involved the you know, coach bribing and the test taking scam and things like that, um, you know, he marketed as a guarantee to parents that were looking for you know, real kind of security about my kid will get into USC or wherever it was. Um, he referred to the front door as that merit-based process that you mentioned where, um, you know, you study hard, you take the test and you cross your fingers and try to get in. Um, and then he also talked about this notion of a back door um, where, uh, although it's legal, um, you know, it, it's different than the merit-based process. And this back door meant, you know, that parents may give a substantial donation to the school um, we hear about, you know, kind of the stereotype of putting your family's name on the library and then hoping that that helps with admissions. Um, it can also mean, you know, having legacy status or connections with trustees or the dean of the school or things like that. Um, what do you think that this notion of the front side and back door says about the fairness and transparency of the college admissions process? Um, you know, regardless of the legality, the technical legality of one versus the other, is there really a difference ethically between the back door and the side door, or are they just shades of the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's a great, great question, and um, you know, I've gotten that sort of a lot over the over the over the past two years. Sort of, what is the difference, and what you know, what it was, what's the back door, what's the side door? Um, you know, I and I, I think we've sort of explained it sort of throughout the case. Uh, you know. In, in our in the in our in the government's view, I think it involves and you know you know in the papers that we filed, it involves a form of fraud, 
uh, which is not present in the, which would not be present in the, in the back door. So I think there, ethically, there would be a difference between those, between those two. Uh, you know, obviously, I think people have attempted over the past two years to sort of um, conflate, conflate the two. And, you know, from a legal perspective, you know, the, the, the job of a prosecutor is to, you know, to, buy, to punish violations of, you know, federal statutes. It's not, it, it's not really a societal job. Um, and to sort of right wrongs, but obviously people have their um, views on sort of the ethics and morality involved in, in sort of backdoor admissions. I think, you know, rather than sort of comment on that, just to, you know, just to sort of shift a little bit and explain, you know, and, and you know, my takeaway from the case was really that it shed, the case shed a lot of a light about what money is involved in the, um, in the college admissions. Right? Rather than saying this, what this person did is right or what this person did is illegal or that, I think, um, you know, people brought up a lot of valid arguments about how admissions are done, how, you know, the purpose of, um, the, the purpose really of, of college, of elite universities and our place of, uh, you know, in, a, in our society, they are typically tax exempt institutions that, we typically think that they have a larger place than simply just being, uh, you know, businesses or something like that. They they're supposed to serve um, the general public good. That's why we 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 lavish uh, funds upon them and we lavish tax breaks upon them. And I think people reacted with the general sort of distaste to the the, the sheer amount of money that was being involved in the emissions process in general. And whether it's technically the side door or the back door wasn't, in my opinion. Um, what was so important, but rather the fact that this exists and sort of how as a society are we going to grapple with that, with the, with the influence of wealth. And, you know, people have had a um, lot of different responses to that. I mean, I, I think, you know, I tend to be of the belief that transparency is a good thing, that, um, you know, the more light that can be shed on emissions processes and, and the less sort of like kept in the dark they are, uh, I think that's a good thing. I think that benefits all. It, it, it allows people to, uh, figure out, you know, and determine what, what truly is merit. And it allows people, it allows um, people to determine whether they, they are interested in going to a school that might, uh, you know, have a backdoor admission policy or, or really focus on, uh, on uh, money in the admissions process. So, you know, I think it, in, in, the, in the whole, it was a good thing. It was a really good thing for um, America to, to learn about. Mm -hmm. Who do you think are the victims of this scandal um, and what have they lost? And, and do you have the sense that the defendants charged have realized any sense of accountability for their actions and the harms to which they've contributed? Sure, um, you know, legally speaking, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the schools or the, the, uh, the testing agencies are, are victims because Obviously, they, if their if their people uh, if their employees were taking bribes, they would they would be a victim. Um, that's from a legal legal uh, definition. Uh, I think if you from the news coverage and from the you know comments that I received, I think throughout the case, I think people really focused on the harm done to to students, um, and people focused on the 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 real issues involving inequality and equality uh, amongst how students were applying and whether students who you know, people, a lot of people use, use the term, um, you know, whether someone deserved to get in to, to a certain school or not. I, I tend to sort of shy away from that, uh, that, that usage because there, there's so many different factors that go into, go into merit um, and why people should get in and, and uh, think, think things like that. But I think everyone can agree that when, when people, you know, apply to a school and, you know, Submit their app, take the time to do their application, do it correctly, do it honestly, pay money to apply. Um, I think those students deserve a fair shake, and I think most people would agree with that. And um, and and I think you know what the what the case exposed was that people were not getting a fair shake. And um, you know I see I keep harping back to transparency, but I really think that's the best, uh, really the the best sauce here for for uh, you know for. For going forward in the emissions process. And thinking more, you know, beyond, um, you know, whether or not they, they fully appreciated what they were doing, um, you know, and, and taking a slightly deeper dive into who these families were, um, many of these families were highly successful, 
not just that they were like really good at their jobs and made a lot of money, but they were really involved in their communities and charitable work. Um, why do you think so many of them were willing to do something um, illegal, unethical, that showed such a lack of integrity to guarantee that they could get their kid into a particular school when they already had so many advantages. So these were kids who were already at these like elite boarding schools and private schools with all these extra resources, like private tutors, they could get, you know, essay help on their college entrance essays, they could get SAT tutoring, they had all these cool internships from connections and life experiences they could write about. Um, you know, why were these parents doing this when they already had so many advantages? Um, what do you think about the motivation there? I mean, it's really hard for me to, to you know, each parent, you know, and uh, had their own motivations. Um, it's really hard for me to, 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 to drill down to what each person think. And it's probably not, not um, a, great, a great use of time. What I can say is sort of what came out at sentencing uh, proceedings and things where I, I was uh, either, you know, a part of or, um, uh, uh, you know, a part of or, or observing as, as, a, uh, as an audience member. But, you know, one of the, there are a couple of themes that we sort of heard uh, in those from, from parents who were um, who had pled guilty and were, were being sentenced by by the courts, um, you know, a part of it is a, a perceived unfairness in the college admissions system that I think uh, a lot of people uh, perceive. I mean, the um, one of the things that, that that's shocking to me is, um, I mean, obviously you compare your 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 son or your daughter against the other people in the in the in the student's school. Um, but, uh, and people always say, well, that person shouldn't have gotten in, that person shouldn't have, you know, my, my, kid, my kid's scores are better, that kid's, I mean, they, they, there's all that sort of gamesmanship that goes on there. Um, and, and I think that's a partly a result of the fact that admissions rates are much, much, much lower than, I guess, when we were, um, you know, applying to school in, in the 90s, um, where you could sort of game it out a little bit of whether you were gonna get into a place or not based on scores, your test, test scores, grades, extracurriculars, sort of where you fit in and plugged into your particular high school. It's much, much harder now. Um, the admissions rates are so low that there's so much more, I, I, would, I would say randomness in the, uh, in the system that makes it very, very difficult and leads people to believe that things are sort of just unfair for better, you know, for better or for worse, um, because it, it's harder to predict. And I, I, I understand that. So part of it's the sort of the uh, insecurity, you know, which is what we heard, heard a lot of. The, the second part is just sort of looking for an easy fix. Um, and I think we heard, we, we uh, in the sentencing that, that came out a lot where parents were interested in, um, you know, it's obviously a, a very stressful time for a lot of parents the, and, and kids, the college admissions process. So if you can sort of short circuit that and, um, you know, and give them that quick fix, the guarantee as you as made before, I think you, you, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you, you talked about that and it just became, became the, an option. Um, and um, I also think we, we, we heard, you know, in the sentencings, a, belief that you know if you if your son or daughter gets into an elite elite institution it's it sometimes somehow validates your your ability as a parent and um and and you know i i, I, I don't think that's accurate but um the uh it was obviously so it's the insecurity of both the difficulty of getting in and also the insecurity of did I not do as good a job with my son or daughter if they don't get into the place that I want them to get into? And that we heard a lot, a lot, a lot about. Um, one thing is it's sort of, you know, we didn't hear a lot about um, was the everybody sort of does it type type thing. Um, I don't, I don't think that was something that came out that much in the, in the sentencings. Um, I, I think for the most part, the, for the people who accepted, people, you know, that the sentencings that I attended, people were, you know, accepting of responsibility and had realized that what they did was, uh, was not in comporting with uh, their values. Um, there's, there's mention in, I think, you know, public discourse these days about this notion of snowplow parenting and that, you know, parents are a little um, 
over eager and over meddling to smooth everything out for their children and just sort of, um, you know, bulldoze everything aside to make sure their children have an easy path through life and are, you know, micromanaging or, you know, yeah. but also helicopter parenting, things like that. Um, do you think this relates to that larger kind of, you know, generational societal issue? Um, and something that came out at least in the book um, was that some of the children were actually kept in the dark about their parents, you know, sort of doing some of these behaviors on their behalf and, um, you know, how disrespected a lot of the children felt afterwards because it sent this message that the children weren't capable of doing it on their own um, or that the parents didn't trust that their kids could um, achieve these things on their own. What's your take on, on that kind of larger, you know, parenting issue? Yeah, it's something from a very, it, it's something that probably becomes the most personal thing to you as a, as a, as someone involved in the case at all. Um, if you have kids and I, I have three and, and it was uh, something that, you know, you know, my, my kids are younger. So I, I sort of felt like I had like, a, you know, a, a, a piece of clay that I could mold at some point to sort of figure out what, what's the best parenting style and what's not. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that, and I hadn't given a lot of thought as to what my, particular parenting style would be. And I, I completely agree. I think that's a, um, you know, it's one of the things that came out there was a, the bigger issue of how much do you shape your child's destiny and how much is he or she allowed to control their own destiny? Um, I don't really have an answer to that. Um, you know, people have to, you know, I, I guess I became, I, at first I was sort of like, okay, well, obviously, you know, snowplow planning is probably not the best for a lot of people. It, it does show a a lack of respect to the to the kids, but I'm also I also sort of shifted a little bit later, being like, you know, uh, I th I think each parent has to develop has to develop their own their own parenting style, and I don't think it's super productive to um, to be casting aspersions as to as to what um, as to as to uh, you know everybody everybody can I, I found it as being a dad everybody has room for improvement so um it's uh you know i'm always hesitant to to uh cast aspersions on, on that but it's definitely you know regardless of arriving at a right or wrong answer I, I think it's the um i think if you read that book that was done the unacceptable book you know you can take from it what you will in terms of how you want to you know be a parent sort of in the future or, or with your own kids yeah, I think that's one of those things that from my, from my own perspective, it's easier said than done to commit to these like lofty ambitions of the perfect parenting. And um, it's uh, uh, easy to, to judge and hard to live up to those standards always yourself. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, thinking uh, ahead and, and sort of the implications of and fallout of this, um, for in terms of long-term, you know, viability and, and increased trust in the admissions process in higher education, have you seen any movement to change admissions processes, add oversight layers in, you know, athletics recruiting, um, or create more robust security measures and standardized testing or things like that in the wake of this scandal? Sure, and I think the answer is is absolutely. Um... I think that's a I think that's a, both a good thing and a, and at the same and, and at the and I've seen it sort of I, I want to say you know I'm not with the department anymore so it's it's less about my own personal experience um, and more like an anecdotal experience about what I what I sort of saw um, you know secondhand uh, and have read about since in terms of like changes that are going to be made I think it's um you know. I think it's a good thing and that there's obviously a check and balance to to a system that people are um, you know verifying you know information is true but people verifying the proctor who said who, who he says he is or who she says he is she is um i think that's good uh at the same time i think it's a little bit sad uh that we that we've arrived at a point where we have to verify and make sure that um you know college applications are are you know accurate and that people are Really, who they say, who they say they are, and that they're real, um, and and that that for me is a little depressing, uh, you know, in a way that this uh, compliance program um, that that it has been sort of put in, put in place. Um, with that said, there are positives I, I, I see, and I don't know if you we want to hit on this more more, more later, but. Um, I think, and I've heard anecdotally about this, so it's not really, I don't know if it's, it's fact or fiction, but uh, from what I've, from, from what I, what I have heard is that 
um, in talking with people, people recently is that the backdoor process has um, been a lot more sort of, I would say curtailed, eliminated, uh, made a lot more transparent in a lot of ways um, where the, and, and I would probably characterize as a relationship between development uh, and emissions. Um, and I think that's probably a good thing, uh, a good thing that I've, that, that has, has come out of the uh, scandal. Hmm. Yeah, the, the um, I think that backdoor notion is is for a lot of people um, their first thought, you know, upon upon um, hearing about this scandal and and as we talked about before, you know, thinking about what are the real differences between that and while there are some, I think you know it does make people feel like there is a lack of transparency and like the game is rigged in in favor of like the super wealthy, yeah. and so you know a sense that that is being scrutinized, I think um, you know is helpful to people's perceptions of of fairness um, in the process. Um, I think you know in a in a large sense, this scandal has really shown a spotlight on inequalities in power and privilege in our educational systems. Um, two of the more poignant points um, from the book Unacceptable that came out to me and that um, you know really made me stop and think were first, um, as I mentioned, there were families who photoshopped their teenagers onto real athletes' bodies, right? Like doing the sport, um, they found something in the media or something and like put their kid's head, literally, I mean, is that unsophisticated, um, you know, onto another kid's um, photo. And, you know, the book really made the point that like that kid whose identity was stolen to be a part of, you know, someone else's college application, they found the backstories of some of the real athletes. A lot of times these were like not privileged kids from rural areas who had worked their butts off um, to succeed in school at these athletics while, you know, maintaining really solid GPAs. Um, and we're from small towns and rural areas where they had no access to this sort of college admissions counseling. They didn't even know, you know, what their options were in terms of four-year colleges. Some of them, you know, hoped to go to a community college and maybe would try for a four-year institution later, but had none of the privileges of, of these other kids. Um, the other point in the book was um, the notion that many of you may have heard about this in the media, that there have been parents who've gone to jail for um, putting an incorrect address on their school enrollment forms for the public school system to try to get their kid into a safer, more stable um, school district, perhaps because they put a relative's address down um, instead of their own to try to escape things like crime and poverty and to just get their kid a shot, you know, at a school that can provide a more stable um, environment to open up more possibilities for their future. And some of those parents have gone to jail. Um, and so when you think about those stories, it really raises, um, you know, this notion of inequitable access um, to things like the education system after um, high school. So do you think American society is ready for a deeper reckoning with this notion of fairness in our meritocracy system, and I say meritocracy in quotes, um, where wealthier, you know, more privileged classes of people have substantial advantages in terms of proving their merit um, and gaining the experiences that qualify as merit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, a terrific question, and, and you know, it's it's something that I think people will will debate, um, and it's something actually I think that the the you know, it's really hard for me to, to, to answer, to answer that just because I think, you know, the, the, I think the thing I'm proudest the most of, I think is, you know, is really just shedding some transparency on the system. And I, I keep, you know, hark, hark, harking, harkening back because I, I just, I really believe that the more transparent things are, the, the better outcomes it is, it is for, for everything. I think it's really hard to, um, you know, develop a fairness, a fair college admission system in general, just because there's so many different variables. Colleges look for, you know, a variety of different things. Um, everything from, you know, geographic diversity to extracurriculars to who's the best volleyball player. It's really hard. To, I mean, the one thing I think I've learned probably in life is that you just can't, you know, two people just aren't the same. And to, and, and so it, it's a, it's a very difficult, um, you know, it, 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 it becomes very, very difficult to say that person should have got in, that person uh, shouldn't have, shouldn't have gotten in. Um, you know, with, with that said, I, I think, you know, 
with everything going on in the world, and it's not just you know varsity blues, but the events of the summer of 2020, um, and I, I just think that colleges are attuned to that, um, and it's a uh, and, and and I'm I'm heartened by that, and I think people people realize that like it's not a great thing for society just to have the same type of people attend a school that attend that their parents did 30 years ago or their legacy like it like. It, that might be good for a little bit, but at the same time, you know, the other values of, a, of an institution, the, the value of an institution of providing a benefit to society is, is buttressed by um, including others who might not have had access to an elite education in the past. So I, I think it's, I think, it, you know, it's been a really good thing. I think one of the things that's come out of the pandemic that's been interesting to me to sort of watch as a, as a bystander is just what the percentage, like, the um, because the schools have gone test optional this year, the uh, the number of applications for a lot of um, the elite schools have skyrocketed tremendously. I think Harvard added like sixty uh, percent on a number of app simply applications. I know I, I read something at Colgate at, like doubled the number of applications, um, which which you know I think is typically a good thing. It can. Um, it can increase diversity and increase, uh, you know, other other people access. But it, it becomes the point: how do you pick these people? How do you pick your class? I mean, and I think that's sparking a huge debate right now. I, I know there have been books written, and maybe we should just, you know, give everybody who has like, you know, the ability to perform at the school, put them in a pool, and then just pick randomly. Is that better than, you know? And then obviously the football coach won't be super excited about that system. So you have to balance out all the different different things. But I think it's, I think, you know, the scandal combined with, you know, with other things has really opened up a, um, a, a debate on, uh, on, on how the admissions process should be run in general. Yeah, and I think conversation and debate and, you know, re-questioning things that we used to take for granted is is always a good thing. Um, and so I think your contributions to that effort are beneficial for everyone. Um, and I'm just thinking back to if I had known, you know, my type A self at age 18 when I was applying, if I had known that I was just going to get like picked out of a pool, I think my head would have exploded. But <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions from the audience, if there are any. So I will um, turn it back over to Iris Elkowitz to see um, what questions he's been fielding from all of you attending. Thank you very much, Melanie. And thank you, Eric, for a, a great thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I have uh, questions I've uh, put into some categories. The first one is really a... Um, a background question and that what was the total value of the illicit payments made by the prosecuted individuals? Yeah, I, I, as um, you know, alleged in the complaint, the indictment, it was about $25 million. Okay. Um, and one person asks, uh, were the universities less than willing to release information that would taint them? Could you speak on some of the issues you obtained and you faced in obtaining facts uh, regarding the case from the university. Right. Well, I, I don't want, uh, you know, it's, it might be, be better if I just answer that from a more general perspective. Um, you know, part of, part of the job of a, of a prosecutor in, in general is, is, you know, working with uh, victim institutions or institutions that, you know, they obviously ha have a stake in what, in, you know, documents and, 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 you know, the need for privacy amongst their students and that type of thing. So like, like any investigation, there's always a, you know, a balancing test, um, a balancing test in terms of what, you know, what should be produced, what shouldn't be produced from the, from the institutions to, to the government. And that, so, so I think that's sort of where I want to, want, want to leave that question, but I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a good question, but I, I think it's probably best to, uh, to stop there. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we have uh, several questions that that relate to the issue of, of power and privilege and, and wealth. And um, so let me go ahead and, and combine those. Um, and and it, it deals with a perception really of, of uh, unfairness in the consequences for those convicted. Um, so one person asks, um, why did some wealthy individuals receive less time in jail and house arrest and lesser fines, whereas some others received heftier punishment? To this individual, it seems like wealth is inversely 
related to the judge's verdict. It gives the impression that there was maybe wrongdoing on top of the wrongdoing. And then the, the second question, which is related, so I'm asking him kind of as a pair, is um, it seems to this other individual that it, it's worth defending these type of cases as, as an accused person because um, it might just result in a few weeks or months um, and then you're back out thumbing your nose uh, at, at, the, at society or the prosecution and even maybe profiting from the celebrity. Um, as a prosecutor, do you think something should be done to add some additional degree of penalty that might actually dissuade such crimes? And, and I would add my um, personal input on here, and that is that um, without really naming names, but it seemed that some of the people accused were accountable um, more, much more early in the process than others who really wanted to fight it out. And, and um, you know, it, it did seem that that maybe it wasn't totally tied to to wealth and power. I'd like to, so we'd like to know some of your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of good questions in there. You know, I don't want to discuss individual sentencing. Um, you know, what what happened or or things like that. There's a lot of different, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of different uh, factors that go into what type of uh, sentence. You know, I will say gener generally, um, you know. They're sentencing. Sentencing's tough. I mean, you know, it's you, you factor in a lot of different uh, analysis that the court does. Not just not just varsity blues, but um, but uh, you know, other 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 crimes uh, as well. Um, factors. You know, the federal sentencing uh, factors talks about things like deterrence, uh, just punishment. Um, you know, the the damage that people have done, the harm to victims, and things like that. And sort of that's where I, I think, you know, I don't think it's appropriate to sort of punish by fiat in, you know, based on newspaper articles, but to really, you really have to focus on the individual sort of at heart. Um, you know, I do think, you know, I, you know, putting aside any individual sort of sentencing, I do think the case had significant de deterrent effects. Um, I don't think that the general point of, of sentencing, at least as, you know, from a general deterrence type of type of uh, view. And I, I think, I don't think this, this is going to happen really again. Uh, I think it's sort of a, you know, based on the sort of the transparency, the sunlight and, and the sentencing. So, um, you know, I, I think we have to look beyond the sort of the individual and focus on sort of the, the, big, the bigger picture here with a lot of the sentencing uh, stuff. But I think there were some great comments in there, but, um, you know, some I, I can't really address. Okay, thank you. And we are getting some questions about changing admission policies and things like that. And I think we'll uh, reserve those for uh, the panel discussion yeah. that will follow. Um, sure. But we have a, a few other questions that um, would be, um, and this one is, is a, a good background question uh, that you've touched on. Um, could you explain a bit more, the person asks, about um, what the, specifically the defendants did that was illegal, distinguishing um, from legal actions such as donations, um, which was their initial defense as reported in the media. And, you know, one question that, that's always interested me are the so-called legacy admissions, where if a, a father or a, a mother or someone, you know, uh, went to the school, you might have a little uh, leg up um, on that process. So uh, what, what exactly did the defense do that went beyond uh, those types of things? Sure, and I'll, I'll relate that back to uh, what Professor K uh, talked about. But you know, it was um, you know, and I'll rely on what what uh, what she said in terms of you know, there was obviously she talked to, she talked about being you know various forms of fraud involved, obviously fake athletes and things like that. And it's not to, I'm definitely not talking about any individual defendant on any on any basis, but in terms of you know the grand sort of scheme as as alleged uh it would it would involve you know typically you know a form of fraud okay um this is a question that's a good question for a, a prosecutor and that is um are wiretaps in your opinion stronger evidence than following a money trail sure and i'll, I'll talk generally about that you know i've done you know a lot of wiretaps sort of as, as a in my time at the department of justice and you know it's a it's a very powerful uh, piece of evidence, um, and I think it's a, uh, you know, 
you know, when you say following a money trail, obviously bank records and things like that are important. And you, it's really hard to view any piece of evidence in, in isolation. But, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, wiretaps and combined with money trail is, is, a, is a, if you have that uh, in a particular case, I think that's a good, that's definitely, you're, you're on the right foot. Okay. Uh, and do you know if the admissions uh, for the people, the students whose uh, parents defrauded the system, were those admissions revoked? That I don't know. I, okay. I yeah, that's uh, something um, you have to talk to uh, the students about. Sure. And um, I uh, another uh, question that that came up, um, and this may be the last one. We may, may have time for a few more, uh, maybe one more after this one. Um, and that dealt with, uh, with uh, as a prosecutor, were you surprised that, that people involved did not do a better job covering their tracks uh, with open phone calls about this and incriminating emails? It seems to this individual who wrote the question that um, they would um, have tried to delete past evidence. So from a prosecutor, prosecutorial standpoint, um, I'm sure you, you uh, enjoyed having that easy trail of evidence, but what were your thoughts on that? And was it easier sure. or harder right. in most cases? Uh, yeah, just, um, you know, from a general perspective and, you know, in, in prosecuting crime, um, I'm typically not surprised about, you know, evidence trails, I think in, in today's day and age, generally, uh, not, not specific to varsity blues or anything like that, but, you know, people exchange text messages, emails, um, things like that. They talk on the phone. It's really hard not to in, in 21st century life. So, it's not really, uh, it's not, you know, particularly surprising to me um, about that. Okay. Um, this person asks, how can ethics education play a role in avoiding these types of issues? Because uh, there's an assumption that the people who are doing the bribing knew right from wrong and committing the fraud knew right from wrong, but somehow were able to justify these actions in their own mind. We just had a program a few um weeks ago, actually, uh, called Why They Do It Inside the Mind of the White Collar Criminal. And, and you know, a lot of us want to try to figure out why do they do it? Um, sure. So go your, your thoughts on ethics yeah. education or other ways. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to overestimate how important um, ethics education uh, is. I mean, it's a, it forms the, you know, the juxtaposition for all our, all our decisions. And now this isn't particularly of RC Blues or to prosecution or anything like that. But um, it's a, uh, it's something that, you know, I think should be, a, you know, a, a cornerstone of education and um, should really inform, you know, our, our decision-making uh, processes. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like it's, you know, it's, uh, I don't quite remember all my classes in law school or in, or in college, but um, there certainly is, is some type of, um, uh, you know, there, there certainly is some type of education, but it also starts from just simply, you know, panels like these focusing on sort of what went wrong and how better decisions could have been made and things like that. I think it's a really important, um, a really important part of, uh, you know, of, of, of people, people's lives. I mean, you know, there are, uh, you know, I think it's also important to, to remember that the vast, vast, vast majority of, of students applying are, are honest and trustworthy and, and should be credited uh, with that. And the vast majority of parents are of the same way. Um, and it shouldn't let people get down on a, on a uh, system, you know, and, and, and one of the things I, I think, you know, that, um, you know, that, that I saw was, you know, reading the comments on various blogs sort of after this, after the scandal broke was that people were, you know, really downtrodden and felt like a, a sense of hopelessness about how, um, you know, difficult it was to get into elite universities. And then, you know, and with this on top of it, and I, you know, I would encourage people not to feel, you know, just to remember like how small of an issue this actually was in terms of total number of people. And, and to realize that, like you know, you still have, you know, you have, don't don't let it get you down. You still have, you still have a shot, and you, you should still do your best and, and put in put in a good effort. Well, thank you for that encouraging note, which is, I think, the best note to end on uh, at this point, this segment of the program. So, I would like to thank you on behalf of all of uh, the schools presenting this program and all the attendees very much for your time. 
that you took to uh, speak with us. And um, thank you again for thank that. You. Now, moving to our, our panel discussion, I'm going to introduce the moderator, Kent Noble is the Bill Daniels Chair of Business Ethics at the University of Wyoming. In 2018, Kent received the Professor of the Year distinction at the University of Wyoming College of Business. Also in 2018, Kent received the Campus Being a Difference Award from the NASBA Center for the Public Trust. In 2019 and 20, UW's Mortar Board Honor Society recognized him as a top prof. Kent was appointed by former Governor Matt Mead to the Wyoming Commission on Judicial Conduct and Ethics in 2018 and reappointed by Governor Mark Gordon in 2021. He also serves on the board of directors of the John P. L. Bogan Foundation and on the board of advisors of the Better Business Bureau Foundation for Northern Colorado and Wyoming. For his outreach efforts, Kent has developed a series of engaging ethics presentations that he delivers to diverse audiences. To date, he's conducted approximately 400 sessions for business, government, and community leaders. In total, participants from all 50 states have enjoyed his talks. And now without further ado, Kent Noble, thank you. Ira, thank you. And uh, thanks for the great Q&A session. A lot of good questions from our audience, so wonderful. Uh, before we get to our panel, I would also like to just thank um, the job that Melanie and Eric did on that first session. I think it set the stage really well for what we will be discussing with our experts here. Now, uh, before we start, I just wanna draw everyone's attention to the principles that are just behind me over my right shoulder here. And these principles were introduced to you at the beginning of our presentation. They are, of course, integrity, trust, accountability, transparency, fairness, respect, rule of law, and viability and together they make up the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative principles. And I just think it's, it's so interesting as we listen to Melanie and Eric and as you'll hear with our panel here, how each of those principles was repeatedly violated during this Varsity Blues scandal. Okay, well, now let's get to our, our star panel that we have here. I wanna introduce these three participants. First up, Shelly Dodd is the Director of Admissions at the University of Wyoming. Her responsibilities include overseeing recruiting, operations, data analysis, campus visits, and events. Shelly also has experience as an Associate Registrar, an Associate Director in Admissions, an Assistant to the Vice President for Student Affairs, and Shelly's son, Taylor, who I had in class, was also a Division I football player at the University of Wyoming, and that seems especially relevant today given the subject matter. So welcome, Shelley. Jill Keegan is in her 11th year as a member of the University of Colorado Athletic Department. Jill currently serves as CU's Senior Associate Athletic Director for Compliance and the Senior Woman Administrator. Jill sits on Athletic Director Rick George's executive team and she has sports administrator duties for CU's volleyball program. Jill came to Colorado from Michigan State where she served as the assistant compliance coordinator. And prior to that, she was assistant director of compliance at Marshall University. And welcome Jill. Our third panelist is Linda Miller. Linda is the deputy executive director of the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. Prior to that, Linda served as a principal at Grant Thornton LLP, where she led the firm's fraud risk management practice. In this capacity, she led more than 150 certified fraud examiners, fraud investigators, and forensic auditors across both the public and commercial sectors. And for your interest, Linda was also a Division I athlete in the sport of rowing and went on to compete in the 2000 Olympic Games. So uh, Linda, as I read that, I realized that you and I have something in common. You competed in the 2000 Games and I watched that on television. So what a small world. That is a very small world. Yes, amazing, isn't it? Uh-huh. All right. Well, um, before I get to some questions, I would just like to encourage each of you, um, as I direct a question to one of you, if you have some comments that you would like to add, please 
by all means. And in a similar fashion, if you have a follow-up question for one of your fellow panelists, I think that would be great too. So I'll just toss that out to you to consider. All right, first up, this question is gonna be for all three of you. And I think we'll go in reverse order. Um, so Linda, we'll start with you, then we'll go to Jill and Shelly. So I want you to take yourself back to 2019 when this varsity blues scandal really started to hit the media. Um, it really captivated the attention of our country, but I'm guessing that the three of you, given your professional backgrounds, maybe had a little different perspective on this scandal. And I thought maybe each of you could share some of your earliest thoughts when this scandal was breaking. And I'd like maybe, maybe you could each take two minutes. So again, Linda, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, you know, for me, it was especially personal because many of the um, the students that were that were a part of the, the kids of, the, of these parents that were trying to bribe these athletic uh, officials were rowers and or they were they were they were representing their children as rowers. So, you know, I, th I think it's, it's interesting for me. I mean, rowing is not a super well-known sport. It's certainly not a football team or basketball. And I think actually that's part of why this scandal, um, why they chose that sport, because, you know, you're not, first of all, you're not really going to, it's going to be hard for you to convince anybody that your kid is a, a great basketball player, but it's not too hard to convince somebody that you're a great rower. A lot, a lot of students start rowing in, in late in high school, or even they begin in college. So it's not uncommon to have um, less experienced people rowing. So, um, but because it was, it was quite galling for me to see you know, these, these people passing their, their children off as rowers and, um, and even using some of the lexicon of our sport um, to talk about their, their kids. So, I mean, for me, it was, I, you know, I think all of us, I'm sure, felt um, a real sense of outrage that this was happening. Uh, I don't know that I was super surprised, frankly, given mm. how much um, wealth and, and power plays a role in college admissions to begin with, but the outright bribery, it was it was so blatant. And, and again, because it was my own little small sport, it was, it was especially galling for me. Yeah, your sport and kind of in your wheelhouse professionally as well. So yeah, thanks, Linda. Uh, Jill. Yeah, you know, kind of somewhat similar to Linda, um, I was I was rather disappointed um, to hear that there were other individuals in roles similar to mine um, that were involved in something like this. Um, you know, I kind of went through the process in my head of how that would happen and, uh, you know, what steps, you know, would you take to make sure that it doesn't happen? Um, but yeah, it was for me, it was a, it was almost more disappointing uh, that someone in a similar role or it, it, multiple individuals in similar roles and, or in similar departments, um, you know, did partake in a, such a scandal like this. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think you you know this because we haven't had a chance to visit about it, but I actually was in the athletics world for five years serving in an athletics department. And I could see how it would be something that would just really grab your attention and say, Wow, what is going on here? Thank you. Uh, Shelly. Well, from my perspective, a lot of us that go into higher ed, we do this for the students. We do this um, for them, with them, and, and, and everything like that. So um, since I am from Wyoming, I was really sad for um, maybe the rural student that lost a, po a possible spot. I mean, the rowing aside and everything like that, it just... Uh, students work so hard and it was just sad to know that um, this kind of thing could happen um, at an institution that like I said maybe took a spot from somebody else that might have been more deserving. Yes for sure yeah it was such um, you know so many scandals um, hit the news and uh, this isn't a question this is more commentary um, they hit the news and you know, we hear them, but we can't really relate to them like we could this scandal, it seems to me, because, you know, we all have kids or most of us or a lot of us have kids and we care about and their well-being and doing well. So I think it caught our attention for that reason, but also just the, the high profile people and universities that were involved in this. It was just so sensational that really drew us in. Okay. Uh, um, Linda, this question is for you, and it's uh, by ignoring any semblance of integrity and the rule of law, 
Rick Singer made an estimated 25 million from parents who were looking to get their children into elite colleges. What do you think made Mr. Singer such a good fraudster? Yeah, it's a good question. And I actually, um, I wrote an article in, uh, in Fraud Magazine uh, right after this came out because what I found about this scandal was um, so resonant in the fraud world, we have this concept of the fraud triangle, um, which was a concept that was coined by a, a criminologist named, uh, named uh, Donald Cressy back in 1951. And his theory is um, very well accepted now that fraud happens when you have three different elements, uh, opportunity, pressure and rationalization. And this case was so clearly um, an example of that fraud triangle because Rick Singer had the opportunity and really the opportunity piece is interesting. I mean, pressure, he wanted to enrich himself and all kinds of people can, you know, I feel like I just need some more money, right? I mean, the idea with the, with the fraud triangle when it comes to pressure is suddenly there's some, you, you can, you know, maybe you have, uh, you know, an extra bill or you want to buy a boat. It could be simple. It doesn't really necessarily have to be pressure. It could just be greed. Um, but opportunity, you know, what, what we find about fraud is um, when you become, when you're a really trusted individual, you're able to gain systems better, right? So Rick, Rick Singer, as well as all the coaches and the athletic um, officials were trusted, that the, the coaches were certainly well trusted. Coaches are some of our, like teachers, are some of our most trusted, um, you know, professionals in, in across, you know, any any area so you have these trusted folks these these coaches and I actually knew a couple of rowing coaches that like Jill was saying you know I, I'm I also have a lot of friends in the rowing coaching community and I was you know very troubled to think they might have been accepting bribes um, and so you've got this notion of these, these these trusted individuals and they're working together for this collusion aspect right and so the college admissions folks they know some of the rules and how to circumvent them. I think that's, again, one of the reasons they chose rowing because it's easier, probably easier to go, to go under the radar and not be seen as well. Um, so you have this, this opportunity that's enhanced, obviously the pressure and then the rationalization. You know, we are, we're so used to wealthy parents making large donations and getting something in return that often the coaches and even Rick Singer himself may have felt like he was just playing a game that everybody plays. And that's your that's how you can rationalize an activity like this. They were talking before when um, when Mr. Rosen was speaking and someone asked, well, how, how would somebody commit this kind of fraud? I think it's really people convince themselves that it's not that big a deal. It's not really a problem. You know, other people are doing it. A lot of wealthy parents are gaming the system. What's the big deal? I'm just gonna take a cut out of it, you know? And so I think that's really one of the reasons he made such a good fraudster. Yeah, that's the, the classic rationalizations really. So good, thank you. Um, Jill, this is a little related to what Linda was just talking about. Um, the Varsity Blues scandal, it seemed to only involve coaches from these non-revenue sports, which have a lower profile for sure. Uh, from a senior administrator's perspective, what does that tell you? Is there any issue with the long-term viability of these sports or, or what kind of message do you take away from this? You know, I think it also just circles back to what Linda just said, that it, it is that low profile and, you know, maybe they're not under as much scrutiny um, or have as many people reviewing their, you know, applications and such, right? So I think it it, it is Truly, it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to impact that would impact them in the long run, but I do think that they, uh, it just, uh, for the sheer number that an institution may go through as far as student athletes coming through the application process, uh, you might have less scrutiny on those lower profile sports. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Shelly, so we've got this, this scandal involving so many schools, so many people, why do you suppose someone in the admissions department at one of these universities didn't discover the varsity blues scandal? Um, uh, great question. So I think what happens, in, and let's just talk sports first off. Sure. We rely on the coaches and the athletic department to um, evaluate talent. And it might not just be talent, it's what they need. They don't need 10 quarterbacks, they need three, four, to be able to fill that funnel. And so we in admissions rely on the athletic department and the coaches to tell us, hey, here's who we're looking at. But we in admissions will look at those academic credentials to make sure that they meet um, that, that threshold of whatever the school is looking for. And so um, we do a good job of looking at, at 
curriculum and, and, and GP and things like that. So um, we're not looking at huddle um, where students, student athletes in high school upload their best highlight reel. Um, right. We're not doing that. So that's where I think there was that, that gap. I got you. So they were clearing the bar that you needed or not you, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. these other schools needed. And as long as they were doing that, you wouldn't have, or the admissions people wouldn't have discovered these other issues for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so Linda, back to you. Um, and Mr. Rosen touched on this. We had parents, coaches, administrators, students, test manipulators. So many parties were involved in Mr. Singer's schemes. Are you surprised prosecutors were able to keep this investigation under wraps for so long? I mean, it started in 2012, didn't break till 2019. Yeah, you know, um, it's paradoxical, but the, the, the more complex a fraud scheme, the more likely it will um, be successful and, and last a longer time. You would think with a lot, a lot of people, there'd be more people to, you know, uncover it. But really, you need all those different players you know, to, to be in on it in order to help keep things uh, quiet, right? And so you've got, you know, the, the parents and the, the test, the people they're paying to, 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 to take tests for these students, and then obviously the coaches and the, and the administrators in the school, they're all working together. And so because they're all working towards a common cause, it is, it is often they're able to keep, keep it from being uh, uncovered. And so I'm not surprised it took so long. In fact, um, you know, I, I would expect that there are, there have been other bribery scandals like this that just haven't come to light. I'm sure, I, I have no doubt that, you know, we know what we know about fraud is that what we, what we've discovered is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot more where, where you, that you never find. And so my sense is there's probably a fair number of this, of these bribery, um, kind of rings going on and they're just, they're just. They're not as high profile. They're not involving celebrities, and they're not involving the same numbers of, you know, dollars. And uh, you know, the fact that Rick Singer himself had created such a network. I mean, he had so many clients, as it were, um, that he was that he was trying to 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 false to to fraudulently get into college. Um, you know, there are some red flags that that they could have uncovered had they looked at. You know, there's ways that administrators can look at someone who looks like they may be suspicious because, you know, that same person is, is, is aligned with so many different applications. And if you can, you know, identify some, some indicators, you might be able to identify this uh, sooner. But again, I think, I think because there were so many people involved, it, it actually was more likely to be successful than not. So interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jill, it appears college coaches have been selling spots on their teams for years. I mean, not only this scandal that we're dealing with, but I noticed the LA Times did, did an in-depth investigative um, article and they found some similar types of scandals. Is it really that easy to pull off in athletics departments? I don't think so. Uh, again, to Linda's point, it seemed very complex and a lot of people involved. And, and, and I would, I would almost disagree that coaches have been selling their spots on teams for years. I feel like this was somewhat isolated, specifically related to ad the admission standards of the institutions involved. It, you know, so I think there's been some reviews of, you know, it was institutions where it was maybe a lot harder to get in or low or percentage of applicants getting into those institutions. Um, you know, I also think a lot of institutions have prior to this and then obviously since have certain processes that they've implemented um, to, to have checks and balances through these processes. It's not just athletics, it's athletics and um, admissions working together and collaborating. Um, so I think there are at a lot of institutions appropriate checks and balances there. Um, you know, and another piece of, you know, so-called selling a spot on their team, you know, I, they were, it seems to me that it was selling, you know, admissions. Those students weren't then on the team, right? They weren't on the rosters. They came and then they quit eventually, right? So, so I would say that it was more about the admissions versus a spot on their team. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jill. Mm -hmm. um, so Shelly, when it comes to fairness in the college admissions process, you know, what are some of the red flags in your industry? 
Well, I'm going to speak from the University of Wyoming because um, we know there's a lot of incredible institutions across the country. And so in terms of fairness, what we do, and we're very lucky, we lay it out there. He, and you, Eric was talking about transparency. Here's the minimum GPA we're looking at. Um, apart from COVID this year, we are test optional like so many other schools. Um, we lay out the minimum ACT, SAT requirement and we lay out curriculum. And then from there, we look to see what makes the most sense. Um, so in terms of fairness, I just, I, I want students and families to know where we're coming from when they are diving into this college search process, because I go back to thinking um, what Eric said, sometimes this is the first time these families have gone through this process. You know, times have changed since all of us may have gone through this and it, it's newer. Um, there's a lot of emotion involved, involved too, because um, students or parents want what's best for their students. So we see a lot of passion, we see a lot of questions and things like that. Um, but again, what we try to do at the University of Wyoming is, is lay out, here's what we're looking for. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you, Shelly. All right, uh, Linda, you had um, an article in Fraud Examiner. And in this article, you noted, and I'm going to quote you here, you said, I'm also an Olympic athlete who, er who earned a coveted athletic scholarship to row at an expensive private university. As a top national high school rower, I was actively recruited by a number of elite colleges and universities. I worked hard throughout my high school years, even missing my senior prom in order to train and achieve success in my sport. Incredible dedication. And you know, we touched on this a little earlier. So here you are, you're this former division one athlete, you're an Olympic rower. And I'm just wondering about your reaction, you know, um, and again, you did touch on this, but if there's any greater depth that you want to go into, um, you, you find out that a lot of these fraudulent applications were based on these students claiming that they were elite athletes, in, including in your sport of rowing. You know, how does this lack of integrity land with you? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I think that integrity in sports, I mean, especially being an Olympic athlete, I'll say that, you know, the Olympic ideals uh, are really about fair play, right? And, and, and a lot of those ethics, integrity in, um, in ethics initiatives, you, you named at the beginning that the Daniels Fund is, um, you know, that, that are a part of the Daniels Fund. These are also very core to the Olympic movement and Olympism in general. And so, you know, I think as an Olympic athlete and, and certainly one who, yes, I mentioned, like there's an enormous amount of dedication. And I, it sounds like, you know, Shelly, you've got a son who's um, playing, playing football at University of Wyoming. You know how hard it is. Um, the training, the hours, you know, the time that these kids put in that I was that I was putting in the times my mother was getting up at four in the morning and driving me down to the boathouse, you know, to row every single day missing all kinds of events, uh, you know, as a as a as a high school senior not getting to do anything that, you know, my friends did that was fun because I was busy trying to, you know, get a scholarship to college and, and to try to row at that level. So it is, it is hard, I think, for all of us athletes. And I think it's another one of those reasons why I got into the business of being a fraud fighter, because, I mean, it, it, there's a sense of fairness that, you know, that some people just can, can get away with, um, you know, using their influence um, and, and, other, and other types of ways of cheating the system. And we, it, all, it affects all of us, but I think those of us who have spent those, kind, those hours of dedicating ourselves to a sport, it is really especially, um, it, re it hits to the heart of our feelings about integrity and fair play in sport and all the things that those of us in the sporting world you know, really hold dear as, as principles. Sure, great, thank you. Um, Jill, before I ask you, um, our next question, and it's a follow-up on your previous answer. I just want to thank you for being a representative here and representing a department that's doing it the right way. And here you are fielding all these tough questions about uh, athletics departments that were cutting corners. And I know you would, you're would you not gonna try to figure anyone, we're, none of us are about that, but uh, I do wanna thank you because you're getting hard questions. And again, you guys are doing it the right way. Uh, well, thanks. We appreciate that acknowledgement. Yeah, absolutely. It's easier we, for me to answer these questions. Yes. Well, um, so as a follow up, um, really thought it was shocking when we learned how much easier it is for recruited athletes to 
gain admissions to some of these elite schools. And it was also pretty shocking to see how little oversight there is of recruited athletes. So I'm just wondering um, when these athletes, these varsity blue athletes show up on, on campus, do they report to their teams? Or you know what what happens when they when they arrive on campus? Well, the straight answer is I don't know. Um, but from what I've read and my interest in the cases, it seems as though they didn't really actually rep necessarily report to these teams, right? Um, you know, I think that there actually is at least for our institution, quite a bit of oversight on our recruited athletes and our, in, you know, our incoming recruited athletes. Uh, it seems as though these, some individuals found a loophole, uh, you know, exposed a weak process and, and took advantage, you know, so the NCA, you know, reviews student athlete eligibility and then the institutions review student athletes for their standards, right? So uh, again, going back to certain institutions have different standards. Um, maybe higher standards where individuals were willing to, again, engage in the fraud and the payment, et cetera, to get them into that institution. Um, you know, I think we, we speaking, maybe the people doing it in the right way, you know, that we were, you, you go through these processes um, intentionally to make sure you are setting a student up for success at your institution. Um, so, um so, so yeah, you, you know, and again, it, there were some that were not, they weren't, they didn't pose as fake athletes, right? It was the false test scores that they yeah, did right, for their admissions piece. So, you know, it wasn't all just athletics fraud through this. There was the test score aspect as well. Good point. Yes, thank you. I do mm -hmm. think for those that were posing as athletes, it might have been kind of uncomfortable to show up there on campus. And in a lot of cases, they didn't even actually play the sport. But anyway, um, so Shelly. In, uh, in visiting with your peers, how common is it for academic professionals to receive pressure from other units on campus when it comes to admitting students? In other words, are people in your position occasionally asked to compromise their integrity? Well, again, I'll speak from the University of Wyoming, but in general, it, it can happen. But going back to what I originally said, a lot of us get into admissions work because we want to work with students. We want yeah. to help. And so um, from my vantage point, we're very lucky in the sense that um, we have posted admission um, standards so students know. Um, I don't get it that I mean, I can't even think of the last time I was questioned about why. Um, why, why did you deny this to? Now, our numbers are very different. We, we admit far more than 5% of, of the applicant pool. Um, and, and so I don't get that as much. Um, I, I'm sure it happens, but I can't speak directly to that. Okay, all right, thank you, Shelly. Linda, back to you. And, uh, you know, those of us who work in universities, we're, we're used to seeing big donors who receive special treatment. Uh, they get special access to people and events, um, you know, maybe trips. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, at what point would you say um, a donation starts to feel and look more like a, a bribe? Technically, a bribe, um, it, for, it's hard. These things are slippery slopes. So, you know, um, and that's, I think that's, that's one of the big tricky parts, right? So a, a political donation, for example, even if you're uh, a, a big name um, entity or organization is, 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 is making a large donation to a, to a politician with a, with a, with a true ex expectation of getting something in return, some sort of, you know, bill being passed down the line that is favorable to them, because they didn't specifically tag that donation to that vote, you know, there wasn't a quid pro quo in the sense of the law. And so, you know, we see this obviously very commonly in politics, right? So the, the, the dirty money that people talk about in politics and, and, how, and how many politicians are beholden to special interests. Well, those special interests aren't bribing by, by the law. They're not bribing those politicians. Those of us, 
that look at how that is done might sort of feel like they are. And so I think that's really the slippery slope piece. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of ways that you can make a donation and say, gosh, it would be great if, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but you didn't just specifically say, I'm giving you this money and I'm expecting this in return. So technically it's not considered a bribe. And that's where it gets really, I think it gets very difficult because I think there are a lot of like softer um, bribery or corruption type of arrangements in this, in this arena. And in fact, you know, I mean, as a, as an athlete, um, and I, I was a, I was a high school crew coach as well for several years. And, you know, I had a couple of, um, kids that wanted to go to different schools and, you know, the, the coaches were flying them all over the country and, and doing all these different things to try to woo these kids. And the parents were, you know, absolutely, you know, involved in trying to help, you know, do what they could to maybe make a donation to the school to see if they could sweeten the deal. And these were seen as just certainly regular kinds of ways that pa that parents and students and, and coaches and, um, you know, so I, I, I do think that this is a, a very um, complicated and from a fraud sense, there'd be, it'd be hard to call, call any of those activities uh, true bribery or fraudulent activity. But I do think that um, it's, it is time to start to think about, and I do think, I'm sure Jill and, and Shelly have lots of examples of the kinds of um, safeguards they put in place to try to keep the integrity in those systems. And I, I'm sure that many schools really try to do that. And I, I, what I suspect is happening is it's, it's case by case, and it has to do with you know a very influential coach at one school, or maybe a more questionably ethics, uh, questionably ethical admissions officer at another school or someone like this Rick Singer um, who who has a lot of relationships. So I do think that it's probably happens more on a case by case basis. And I think it's extremely difficult um, to prosecute. I think it's very difficult to even make a case that bribery has occurred in this this case being a real clear um, outlier. Yeah, thank you. Good. So, uh, Jill, one of the universities that was spotlighted in the Varsity Blues scandal had four people in their athletics department who received bribes, accepted bribes. It's possible that these were just a, a few bad apples in the department, but to me, it seems like it's, it's possible it's a, it's a cultural problem in that particular department. Don't know for sure, obviously, but it seems like it could be. I'm just wondering what safeguards can an athletic department put in place to help reduce the likelihood of, of such behavior? Um, you know, I think that's where campus collaboration is crucial. Um, working with our admissions office recruitment, everybody, making sure everyone's on the same page, making sure you have multiple um, sets of eyes on maybe your recruitment list, that it's not just one person that holds this list and maybe takes it in front of a committee and asks for a, you know, a a student or a number of students to be admitted, um, that it's getting um, people in, in multiple people involved. So someone might be like, could, could wave a flag. So there's not multiple bad apples involved in that process, right? Uh, I can't speak to culture at other institutions, um, but I could, I, I would say that, you know, if it, it starts from the top, right? If it yes. Are, you know, it starts from the top with all of these core principles of integrity, right? And then if that's the theme and the culture throughout your department, it will carry along. Um, again, I can't speak specifically sure. to another institution, um, but it does start with your leadership. When, you know, when this scandal broke, just kind of a follow-up question, um, were there new conversations in your department that kind of dealt specifically with what was going on here? Uh, not at CU, but, you know, I assume you, you know, brought it to your coaches' attention. And well, we had lots of discussions around that, you know, and, and you go back and you review your processes to, to say, well, maybe there is, someone hasn't poked these holes here, uh, but are there holes here that could be poked to, to make yeah. sure you shore up your processes to make sure something like that doesn't happen? Yeah, and I loved what you said about really the tone being set at the top, because that, that is so important. If it's important to senior leadership, it's going to filter down, it seems, through the department in, in not just athletics, but in any organization, really. Absolutely. And Kent, real quickly too, yeah, I think it takes a really um, strong compliance person in athletics. 
Um, we work closely with our compliance person and there'll be times where a parent will call and say, my son's being recruited or my daughter's being recruited. And it takes me one call to sort that out. So I agree with Jill, we have to make sure we have good working relationships um, with our uh, admissions and athletic department, specifically well, compliance. I know CU Boulder has a really strong compliance person because she's on our panel. All right, so uh, Shelly, given your 25 years of enrollment management experience, have you noticed a change in parental involvement and expectations over the years? And if so, what effect has it had on students and you know, their long-term health and, and viability? Yep, I've seen over my 25 years in the different offices and especially in admissions, um, parents are much more involved in um, their students' lives um, in terms of, you know, picking the best daycare, best middle school, high school, private, whatever it might be. Um, I think that puts a lot more pressure on our students, our, uh, the students that are coming in, um, because they don't know any different. They don't know that maybe a bike ride instead of going to that practice and then that weightlifting and then that second practice of the day isn't isn't maybe normal. And so I think what I see is that we do have um, some more mental health issues that we're dealing with right now because there's so much pressure on students to perform and do well in the classroom and to do well in their outside the classroom opportunities and sports or drama or student government or anything like that. And so what I kind of think about when I think of um, the Daniels Fund and the ethics, uh, going back to that integrity, trust, accountability. What are we all working for? We're working to help our students become um, good individuals. And then hopefully when they get jobs, they can contribute in a positive way. Um, and I just, I, it makes me sad sometimes to see some of our students that are so stressed out about achieving and, and the bar is here. And if they don't meet that bar, they feel like failures. And I'm like, no, you're just as successful for trying than for just for not so. So true. And I'm sure Jill sees the stress in students. I know I see it in the classroom and uh, many meetings with students that are just, uh, they're overwhelmed. They really are. And um, we need to do something about that. It's a problem. Linda, um, no secret that many universities are struggling financially. Um, and you mentioned how you know, when fraud's happening, often it's just the, the tip of the iceberg. Do you, you foresee more fraud scandals as it maybe relates to admissions coming, uh, coming down the pike? Yeah, let me just say on the back of what Shelly just said that yeah, I have, I'm also the, the mother of a junior, high, a, a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're just beginning the college um, application process and he's also six foot nine and he plays basketball. So, so we've got a lot, of, a lot of these themes happening in my own life right now. I'm trying really hard not to be that parent. And so this is a good reminder to me to just let him do his thing and not, and not get involved. So <laughs> thank you, Shelly. Um, I wish Jill hadn't heard you talk about <laughs> your son because we might have the inside shot at him. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, in terms of the, yes, of course, when fraud happens a lot more when there's um, any kind of economic disadvantage situation, right? So, for instance, I work right now at the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, which is looking at fraud in pandemic spending. And obviously, we've got a free for all of fraud right now as a result of the, the vast amounts of money, but also people just being so in such dire situations economically. Um, they're driven to do things they may not have otherwise done. I think it's important to know about fraud is, you know, we, we think about fraud, we often think about bad guys, you know, bad people. A lot of times it's, it's, it's what you might, you know, they could be your next door neighbor or, you know, someone you went to high school with. They could be like generally a, a good person who's decided or they, they've got some sort of competing priorities in their lives that have just made them do things that they maybe wouldn't have otherwise done. That's important to recognize because, um, you know, you as an organization, like Jill was saying, you're going back and looking at your policies. How can we shore them up? Where could we have been a victim? You know, we just didn't know it because we didn't really take a look at these policies. It's important now in this environment where 
um, especially during the pandemic where a lot of colleges are struggling with um, enrollment numbers going down. Um, and, and, you know, they may be looking more, they want more students potentially to come in. They may be looking to cut corners more. They may be looking the other way to accepting students that they otherwise wouldn't have accepted, especially if they're coming with a large um, financial gift. Um, and so when the, and when they're struggling, when the schools are struggling. So I do think it's time now um, for these schools to put in place uh, more anti-fraud controls. And I agree, it's it's really about ethics and, and training. And I know that um, I, I, I think, or someone that spoke earlier does a lot of ethics training. Ethics training couldn't be more important now. This is the, the, the time, if ever there was a time for ethics training, it's now. And making sure that senior leadership and administration officials um, are thinking about these things because they're, the opportunities um, and the pressure to, to commit fraud is just going to increase. And so the likelihood of, of seeing more schemes like this in the future are unfortunately probably higher. Well, and you make such a good point about uh, good people getting involved in these bad situations. And I think that's where that fraud triangle that you were talking about earlier uh, comes into play where we have these opportunities, got the pressure, and then you can rationalize it to yourself. So Excellent point. Um, Jill, as we all know, many coaches, or I guess I should say most, if not all coaches, are held accountable when it comes to having winning programs. Yet some of these varsity blues coaches, you know, made arrangements for students that weren't going to be able to help their program. It seems to me to give up possibly some, some spots on your team that um, you'd either have to be really secure in your job or maybe feel like you're on your way out um, and you could benefit financially. Do you have any insights on this or thoughts on this? You know, in thinking about this one, it, it to me, it seems like maybe when a, a coach got involved, um, part of the, the value of that, that fundraising that maybe they mm -hmm it under uh, was either for themselves or for to support their program. Um, so um, I don't I don't know if they trying to get into their heads of why yeah. uh, and justifying it is tough. Uh, but I could see where the financial security, again, whether it's for themselves or for their program or for their department, I, I think that seemed to to me, that was my analysis of play, the financial aspect of it. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you, Jill. Um, panelists, I'm guessing this may be our last question. So um, I'm gonna direct it to Shelly, but uh, love to hear from the rest of you as well, if you have any thoughts on this. And Shelly, each year, as you know, the US, US News and World Report ranks the country's best colleges. And while there are certainly some benefits, there are also some downsides, such as it's virtually impossible to rank colleges accurately and consistently. I'm curious what you think about the fairness of the rankings. Is it possible that they do more harm than good? Um, okay, so we have a, a number of fantastic schools across the country. And I think sometimes the rankings can hurt if a family is chasing something that isn't in the best interest of the student. Mm -hmm. Um, because sometimes um, it could be about the cocktail party. Well, where's your son going? Where's your daughter going? Well, mine's going here, mine's going here. You know, I was never more proud than when I could say my son uh, chose the University of Wyoming. And full disclosure really quickly, he spent four seasons on the team and he just graduated in three and a half years. So he is moving on now to grad school. I wanted to share that, but Great life lessons. Um, but going back to that, I think sometimes it kind of was what Eric was leaning into. Families want to impress their peer group, whatever that peer group is like, well, we're going here. And it's a we instead of like, where's your son or daughter going? My son chose the University of Wyoming for various reasons. I also have a high school senior right now. Um, we're not looking at rankings and what he's looking at is the University of Wyoming and I'm not twisting his arm, I promise. Um, he'll be fourth generation UW student here um, in the fall, but I think rankings are tricky because a lot of times it's about the number of applications that come into a school. It's about acceptance rates. It's about a lot of different things and it's so subjective. Again, what I want to see is that a student is going to thrive 
and do well in the classroom and outside the classroom with whatever that might be, whether it's sports or student government or, or, or intramurals or, or, or whatever it might be. And so um, rankings are tough. We, we are not part of those rankings necessarily, but we have ours that we're proud of in terms of different programs. Um, but I just think families need to look at them and really educate themselves on the process. And the other thing I want to add is that admission reps are there to help throughout the entire process. So Linda, as, with your high school um, junior, and I'm sure he's getting a lot of looks being 6'9", because that will open a lot of- <laughs> You can see him from a long ways away, Shelly. Yep, 6'9", will really. But what I, what I think is important for all of our students and families as they're starting this college search process and really narrowing down, find out what, ask the question what you want at this time. You know, they may wanna go into a certain area and then all of a sudden they change their major when they get here because they found something else. But I want students to figure out fit and where they see themselves being successful. And I think that's really important because if you're miserable at school, there's nothing that is going to help you get out of that situation um, other than yourself. Linda or Jill, any thoughts before we wrap this up and turn it back over to Ira? And don't need to, but I just thought I'd give you the opportunity. No, I don't have any none. Okay, all right. Well, panelists, thank all three of you. And don't go away yet because we've got Ira coming that's gonna shoot some uh, questions from the audience, but I sure appreciate your time and you've been great to work with. So thank you. And with that, Ira, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for a great discussion, uh, Kent, for leading it, and Linda, Shelley, and Jill. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a question, um, and these anyone can um, chime in, um, but some are a little more directed than others on, on their subject. So, Shelley, this is really more about the nitty-gritty of admissions. Um, colleges are moving away, especially during the pandemic, but moving away from the SAT and ACT tests um, and maybe making them optional. Do you think that'll um, give more opportunity for wealthy families to game the system? And, and you know, this also relates to, you know, possible risk of fraud. So I'd like to hear um, what Linda um, and, uh, and Jill think as well on that. And then um, related is another question to the, the pressure aspect, especially of the fraud triangle. Uh, what, is, what are the thoughts of moving towards a, a minimum necessary type system of college admissions rather than greatest merit? Um, maybe we should start with Shelly and then open it up. Okay, I'll start with your question on the ACT. Um, because of COVID, a lot of students across the country could not sit for their ACT or SAT exams in the spring. Um, so we, like many, many other schools, went test optional. We're going to start looking at the data. But one of the things that I can think of is that for students that aren't prepared or have the ability to pay for that test preparation, um, it makes it difficult for them, perhaps, because there's some timing issues with the exams and it, it's strategy and things like that. So when you start looking at high school grades, that's a body of work over four years. And so you get to see what students um, have been taking, how much they challenge themselves, how much they might be trying to protect their GPA. I know a lot of students get really upset with us because we look at an unweighted GPA for scholarships because we have students applying from across the country and we're trying to just look at it from one lens and a 4.0 scale. Um, a student or parents will say, then why did I make my student take all those AP classes? Well, they're trying to prepare, the students need to try to prepare themselves for college. So I think AP and IB and all those honors classes are important. But again, if we take away the ACT and just look at what they're taking in high school, that's over four years and we get a better sense of what they're doing in the classroom and what they potentially can do. Um, so lots of, lots of discussion around that, Ira. Linda or Jill, do you think that doing away with tests might open the door for fraud or maybe actually be a better way to go? I mean, in my opinion, you've got um, one less lever to pull. Um, so, you know, I think 
to the extent that, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think any of the, the students in the Varsity Blues scandal actually, um, they did have somebody take their SATs for them, I believe. There was some of that happening. And so, you know, obviously you can't, that's not going to help you um, as much. So you've got one less um, mechanism to use to attempt the fraud. I, I mean, I do think that, the, you know, I do think it's pretty unusual that people are paying somebody to take an SAT for them. I don't really think that's a very common, that's one of the reasons why we're talking about it today, because it's, it's so outrageous, right? This scandal was just so outrageous. So, but I do think that um, it increases competition, right? They talked earlier about 60% to 100% more applicants to the schools now that they're going test optional. So I think that, you know, you're going to increase competition that is going to increase um, people's desire to do to to do things that you know that 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 compromise integrity to try to get in. Thanks. I don't have anything specific related to the test score. Okay, that's fine. Um, so the the um, thoughts on um, the minimum necessary. Let's uh, maybe relate that also to a, another question, and that is. Um, does is there some difference in the application this is really for the whole panel um and it's also like other questions that we asked in the first half a perception question is there a, a difference between the, the real application of admission standards for athletes and non-athletes jill i'll take that one first and then no there's not not here, and I don't. I don't believe there is. Um, I, I'll let Jill jump in, but no. To answer that, simply no. Um, there have been times we've had applicants, and I'm like, it's not. It's it, it's not in that student's best interest. Um, it, it just it it goes back to what Jill said. We want to set students up for success. We want them to do well. We want them to not only retain but to graduate, because that means so much in the future. Um, so. The short answer is no. Jill, I'm sure you have something. Yeah, um, and the short answer for CU Boulder is also no. Um, but there are some institutions throughout the nation um, they utilize, it's often referred to as a special admit process. Um, and it's not necessarily just for athletes. It could be for students applying into um, different programs um, music school, music, you know, all different things where maybe it's beyond just the academic side, you have additional um, expertise to bring to the university. Um, and so I think that's what was utilized. The special admit process, I think, was maybe utilized through some of the institutions involved in the scandal um, where they were reviewed differently than uh, the general student body for admissions. I just add that as a scholarship athlete, when I was in college, um, we had a special tutoring plan just for us scholarship athletes because um, some of us, they didn't think <laughs> we're gonna be able to make it all the way through college without a whole lot of extra help. And that was a, a program that was in place when I got there and I had like regular meetings with the scholarship athlete tutor. And I, I mean, I was, I'm happy to report I was I was perfectly okay with <laughs> with getting through college, but I mean they did they did have an expectation that a lot of us that were on scholarship were maybe going to need some academic support. So I mean I you know I think it's like Jill said I think what I, my observations and from being an athlete and being around uh, helping get athletes into college is I don't I think it's this is one of those things where it's probably not like a policy, but I do think there's a number of universities and colleges that um, have a unspoken rule that the, that the, that the, that the, that the, the bar is lower to get some athletes in. Um, and because they want the athletes, the coaches push. I mean, I, I know because I have some friends who are coaches and they are like trying to get kids in, like maybe I can get this one in, you know? And so, I mean, I do think there's a huge amount of tension between the coaching staff and, and, you know, and, and the admissions office, you guys are in both of those places in your universities. So it may not be in every college, but I, I do know some, some ex examples where there have been challenges with the, the coaches really wanting to get an athlete in um, and, and trying to work really hard to get that athlete in. And I'd, I'd like to piggyback on the, uh, the tutoring aspect, you know, part of the NCA regulations is that we need to provide 
academic support for our student athletes. Um, and it goes beyond academic support. It's time management. It, it's, a, it's a lot of life skills there as well. Um, and, and I think part of the rationale behind that is to be able to also to monitor um, and to make sure that individuals that are providing tutoring to student athletes are following, you know, set specific rules, ethical behavior. Um, and then, you know, cause then you could get into academic misconduct on yep. campus and that's the last thing you want. And so I think there are, you know, there's additional intent behind having uh, tutors and academic support provided to student athletes, uh, not just for their success, but also to have some checks and balances as well. Yep. Yep, I think you're right. And I think we saw that quite a bit actually where um, sometimes the students were trying to get around and using, um, you know, different, there was some academic misconduct to try to, you know, because, and I think it's a legitimate point. Athletes tend to, especially if they're in high profile, extremely time consuming sports, it's difficult for them to maintain, um, you know, their studies and be on these very, you um, these very rigorous uh, college athletics programs. So I do think I, I agree. It's 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 very. I think it's very complicated how how these athletes get in and how and how this, this, the universities provide the support to them. And I think it really varies by the university or the college. Ira, if I could just jump in for a minute, I was listening and I want to just offer a faculty perspective. Um, and I'm sure it's the same way at CU Boulder. I love what the athletics department does to help the students be successful. Our students communicate so well with us about when they're going to be traveling, what their schedules are. And I, I tell you, I am just really impressed with the student athletes in, in the classroom and their performance. And it's, it's because it's important to the athletics department, it becomes important to the students. And uh, so I just, I applaud people in, in Jill's position because it's done well. Okay, I'll duck back out. Thank you. Um, here's a question that came from one of our CU Denver faculty members. Why do football and, and uh, men's basketball players at Power Five schools have such low graduation rates? Any thoughts on that? I'd say maybe part of that is the option to leave school early to go professional and to go um, earn money in that way. Um, part of what we do at CU Boulder, we also have a degree completion policy to help support those students to return eventually to complete their degrees. And then they're outside of our six year window for GSR. And even if they graduate, we aren't adjusting for that. So I think that that's uh, a piece behind that is they have the they have more opportunities to leave early before graduation for to continue their career in sports. And the financial pressure can be extensive, right? Absolutely. You know, the, the financial pressure related to supporting your, your family, you know, or, you know, so, so yeah, there's a, it's a hard choice for those students, I would say too. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and um, this, I think, is going to be for um, all of you, really. Um, and it deals with the ever controversial topic of government regulation. Um, one of the speakers indicated that there's probably more uh, admission scandals out there, just not as high profile and yet uncovered. Should college admissions be more regulated? Um, and would that make more sense at a state or a federal level? Um, you know, what would the issues be with regulation? I'll jump in really quick. Um, you know, more regulation always can be more challenging. Um, we have an incredible board of trustees and a president who are going to look at our admission standards, make sure they're fair, things like that. Um, what I would say in turn, because I, I, again, I, I go back to families. I'd love for the families um, to reach out with questions for help when they're wondering about the college search process and what they're looking at. We've got great high school counselors, but again, we have great people across this country in admissions that want to help. And I think, um, you know, regulations aside, I think just educating yourself more on how this works and how there's a multitude of different schools and different levels of admission standards and things like that to look at, um, I think that would be helpful. Say, Jill mentioned earlier something I think is really important is like, you know, you want to you want to put in place 
policies within your own school. I don't think regulation is really the answer, like from a state or federal level, but you know, for instance, don't have just one person involved, right? Like have multiple people. So um, have these sort of set what they call segregation of duties, which is a really common anti-fraud control. Make sure that, you know, that, it, that if, if a coach is saying this athlete has, you know, what they need, is, can somebody double check that? You trust the coach, but verify, right? So yes, this is, I'm sure this athlete, I, you know, we trust you, but we have a policy that we're going to have someone else look at this person's, you know, information, talk to their high school coach and find out if in fact they really are an athlete. If someone had done that in the Rick Singer case, they would have found out that many of these were not actual athletes. If someone had just called up the call it the high school crew coach and said, can you tell me about this rower? And so, you know, I think putting in place some common sense policies that put checks on the different folks in your organization is the probably the smartest way to try to address it that doesn't involve regulation. Well, this uh, it's two o'clock. And so I uh, thank you again, panelists, for all the time you've spent with us and uh, to Kent for moderating the panel. And Melanie is going to wrap us up. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Ira. Um, on behalf of all four of our schools that are co-sponsoring this event, I want to say a huge thank you to our three panelists today, Shelly Dodd, Jill Keegan, and Linda Miller. A huge thank you to Eric Rosen, um, and a big thank you to the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program, of which we're all members and that make events like this possible. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your attendance and hope you'll join us again for future events.